Welcome back to America. So we're focusing on what's happening on college campuses throughout America with regard to Jewish students and how they have been through the gauntlet of criticism and even in some cases physical attacks because of what took place in Israel on October 7th. Ken Tashi uh, has served as general counsel for the Massachusetts Community College System for uh, more than 21 years he, and currently serves as a higher education attorney and consultant. He joins us now to talk about uh, the, the problem on college campuses. We've just talked to Zachary Marshall, Ken, uh, about some of the things that he's been witnessing on college campuses, for example, at Drexel University and other schools. What are you seeing in, in your area as it relates to Jewish students trying to find their way to go to school in peace and not in discord and the threat of violence? Well, what we've seen uh, at Columbia University, for example, and across higher education over the better part of the last two or three months has just been a elevation and prioritizing of the demands of protesters and professional agitators over the interests of a vast majority of their students, including Jewish students, uh, and, a, and an interference with the normal operation of these institutions that's undermined, among other things, of the teaching and learning process. And it's made it very difficult for Jewish students and others alike uh, to continue with their education, to benefit from the services that have been promised by, by these institutions. And as of late, we just had Senator Rubio in Florida demand that Columbia, among others, uh, reimburse students and parents for the loss of educational services that they've experienced as a result of uh, the, the, uh, the involvement of protesters and professional agitators on their campuses. And I'm hoping that uh, there is some action there and that parents and students uh, will be much more critical consumers about the, where they're going to spend their education dollars and consider the way these institutions have handled these protests. Yeah, and to Senator Rubio's point, college is expensive. And when you go to a school like Colum Columbia or Harvard, that is a lot of money. I mean, how much, give me a ballpark figure of how much it costs to get a four-year degree at Columbia. Well, at Columbia, the cost of attendance at Columbia is, is around $80,000 a year, you know, so times four. Uh, and they make all types of representations about what uh, educational services and experiences you're going to benefit from if you pay that kind of money to attend Columbia. And when Columbia then, uh, in, uh, for example, cancels um, commencement activities for undergraduate students or cancels in-class, in-person instruction and goes to remote instruction and effectively closes its campus down, uh, you're not providing the, the goods and services that you promised. And I hope parents and, uh, and students will pursue breach of contract uh, complaints among others against these institutions. The, the pro-Palestinian campus protests that we've seen at Columbia and elsewhere, as you know, interfere with classroom instruction. Uh, it created unsafe conditions on campus and it led to some of the students actually having to uh, leave school and, and try to do things uh, virtually, almost going back to COVID days. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and those students were Jewish students. But I'm also curious, uh, Ken, what about the Christian students who support the Jewish students and they support each other, or even the Islamic students who support Christian students and, and Jewish students, everybody supporting each other except the, except the protesters? who are anti-Israel, right. anti-America. What's going sure, on? Sure, these students, all the students you've identified were negatively impacted by the weak, anemic, and timid response from so many presidents in higher education around the country. Um, and that's really unfortunate. I think in, in many ways, uh, presidents lost their way in, in addressing these protests immediately and decisively. I think some of them confused uh, their own views and opinions about uh, Israel uh, with, with a role and responsibility as the chief operating officer of their institution. I think others were just frankly frozen in fear to act at all because they feared uh, being labeled uh, uh, an oppressor under the diversity, equity, inclusion dogma of the day. But, you know, whatever the reason, um, they, they've undermined their ability, their institution to provide teaching and learning. Uh, they've, they have uh, jeopardized safety and security for all these students on campus. 
and and they really have done nothing more than incentivize uh, future mob action, which is of concern. It's a concern indeed, and right now uh, we're in a summer recess, but eventually students will be coming back to campus. Correct. If you were advising college presidents right now, as well as their uh, admissions board and their board of regents and, and, and the entire body of uh, faculty and staff, what would be your advice to them about leadership that serves all students equally and fairly? Sure. First thing I do is I put all presidents and all college administrators and all their boards of trustees through a First Amendment training so that they could understand the distinction between peaceful protest and what we saw on many of these college campuses, which was not peaceful protest, which was not protective of the First Amendment, which was more tantamount to harassment, threats, intimidation, vandalism, damage of property, interference with the normal operation of the institution, none of which finds cover under the First Amendment. Um, and I think that would be my, my first step. Second would be to look at college and university policies, procedures and policies to ensure that those policies protect the right of free speech on campus, but then also underscore the and, and use as a stark contrast, uh, in many cases, the illegal conduct that we saw engaged on our campus and unfortunately tolerated by administrators and presidents. And third, I think boards of trustees really need to, to evaluate the performance of their presidents under these circumstances and make some very tough decisions about whether they want the same individuals leading their campuses come September. You're a parent and you know, you, you've seen what's happened on, on these college campuses. What do you say to your child who is scratching his or her head saying, my goodness, have I made the right choice in going to the school of my choice and finding out that it's, it's, it's now disrespecting me and my faith? You know, how, how do you advise your child and work alongside your child to help them maneuver through this, this, this treacherous, path, treacherous path that they're facing, facing right now? Sure. I mean, if I was a, a parent right now of a, a, a high school student considering uh, college education, I, I would absolutely spend some time scrutinizing the way in which individual campuses handled uh, the protests and, and, and the result of, of their actions or inaction. And I think, again, parents and students need to be much more critical consumers about what uh, representations are made by institutions uh, and whether they fulfill those promises when you're on campus or do they uh, capitulate uh, and uh, respond to the, the demands of the mob and the professional agitators when pushed. And I think parents and, and students should really be critical about where they're going to spend their educational dollars uh, and find institutions that at the same time support free speech and expression uh, and, uh, and also provide um, unwavering support for the teaching and learning process. And if you can't find that, then I'd go elsewhere. Yeah, and, and many students are doing that. Many students are electing to go elsewhere. For example, Yeshiva University here in New York, which of course is a Jewish college or university, mm -hmm. I should say, has uh, seen an increase in enrollment. But as the president of that uh, great institution has stated, we can't take everybody in. So right. there has to be, um, there, there, ha there has to be other institutions uh, that can be able to accept students from all backgrounds. And we do see an increase in that, that many Jewish students are now opting to go elsewhere. Uh, Christian universities, Catholic universities, they're all basically saying, we welcome you with open arms. Uh, and that's, that's really good because I think it shows an alliance, a moral alliance between people of different faiths, acknowledging and appreciating and understanding and recognizing people of faith and making sure that they have that and can still have a good education. Sure. And look, I also think it's important for parents to seek to align with organizations like Campus Reform, who have pursued a number of legal actions against uh, higher educational institutions uh, for potential violations uh, under federal law. And I think Congress also needs to act and use as a threat the withholding of or reduction of Title VI funding for these institutions where they failed to provide a, a safe and secure environment. 
And, um, you know, I also, you know, in, in my experience over 21 years, I advised over 50 college presidents. And among their duties and responsibilities, one of the things I emphasized to them that at the end of the day, their ultimate responsibility was to provide a safe and secure campus. And without that, nothing could follow. There's no teaching and learning. There is no open exchange of ideas and discussion and dialogue, and there's no academic freedom. And for those presidents uh, that capitulated to the demands of the mob, I would again hope that their boards of trustees are paying some attention to that and are gonna take appropriate steps come fall. You know, what you said is really so important because at the end of the day, it really is about education, shining a brighter light for our students to show and giving students the hope that they need to elevate their status in life and reach out and help others. That's really what I, I, I value my higher education and teaching me to be a better citizen. I may, I, I may not always get it right, but at least I have that education. And, and the school that I went to had a moral code that I had to adhere to, even as a young adult trying to find my way. Uh, have we lost that in America? Well, I mean, I sure think a lot of us believe that uh, and have grave concerns about that. And, and it's important to, to always keep attention and focused on that issue and, and try to do the right thing when we can do the right thing. And, and I also want to add, though, too, that I'm, I'm not uh, encouraging muzzling students on campus simply because they may express a conflicting or differing view from others. I, I think that's at the core of First Amendment protections. I don't think we do enough uh, of an of a ideological focus on our campuses. We spent a lot of years talking about affirmative action based on race. I'd like to see some cases the focus be less on uh, sort of what people look like and more on what people think, because there, there is a value to having ideological diversity on our campuses and to allow and encourage and, and really demand that people engage in the kind of open dialogue, discussion, debate that leads to if not an understanding of the other side, at least a tolerance of the other side. And I really feel that that's where we have failed collectively and in particular in the higher educational setting. You know, you're touching upon something and I want to talk about that. Uh, I need to take a break. When I come back from the break, I want to talk about that, that common ground we need to find on our college campuses because it will bode well for the country when these college students grow up and become leaders of corporate America. I'm talking to Ken Tashi. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to America's Hope. I'm talking to Ken Tashi of Campus Reform, and we're, we're, we've been discussing the, the problems that Jewish students have encountered uh, since October 7th, uh, uh, this October 7th attacks on Israel and the aftermath of that. And, and Ken, one of the things you were talking about previously was the fact that you want to see people come together from all backgrounds, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Hindu, I, you know, whatever. <laughs> Bring them together sure. in a setting to sit down and really have a dialogue. Now, college presidents have talked about that, but they've excluded certain groups. Most notably, they've excluded the Jewish groups that are the very... Uh, <laughs> the very subject that we're talking about right now. You've got to bring everybody to the table, as Dr. King says, have a seat at the table of brotherhood uh, in order to do some good. Well, you know, institutions do a lot of talk the talk, but they fail in many cases to walk the walk in and around the issues about ideological diversity. And you see it all the time on college campuses. If you've got someone who's identified as a, quote, conservative speaker, um, you will routinely see that individual's event canceled by pressure of, of groups on campus and administrators capitulating to that pressure, or if the event actually moves forward, it being interrupted uh, by screaming and yelling um, uh, protesters or folks marching through, doing everything and anything they can to disrupt it. That, that's generally known as a heckler's veto. And no one has a First Amendment right to do that because not only are you denying the person the opportunity to convey the information that they're there to convey, but you're also denying those in the audience the opportunity to listen and hear and make decisions and choices on their own. Um, and there is nothing I think is more counter than the teaching and learning environment that institutions that, uh, again, capitulate to the loud voices uh, among the, the other voices on their campus that allow for such speech to be denied. 
And um, we need to really focus much more effectively on addressing that. I hear you loud and clearly, but I, I've got to ask you, who's fueling the misinformation and the Hamas propaganda? Who's fueling that kind of rhetoric in our students in order for them to go out on college campuses and say death to Israel and death to America? Sure. Well, you know, look, I mean, there's a lot of folks right now that are pointing to the educational system in the United States that that spends um, less and less time on the critical core functions of education, the critical core skills that students need to develop in order to engage in critical thinking. Um, and, and, and that's a real concern. I think when you get in higher education, uh, you have uh, in the classroom and in the corner office, um, folks that are ideologically of the same bent. You have very few individuals in leadership positions and in the classroom in higher ed that offer a diverse ideological viewpoint. So in many cases, it becomes an echo chamber. Uh, and if you have uh, uh, initial beliefs, those beliefs are reinforced in, in the classroom in higher education. Um, and, and I think we've seen that here. We, we saw um, uh, faculty and staff around these institutions, not just presidents, supporting these protesters, uh, chanting along with these protesters, calling for, uh, you know, the river to the sea and, uh, and, and other chants that, that indicate um, a, a somewhat of a, of a hatred and distrust for, for Israel and Israeli students and Jewish students. I run a group that, that's, that's national, it's called Jewish Students for America. We advocate for um, you know, combating anti-Semitism across the country in line with American principles. So from those students, we've heard about students have been spat on, harassed. Um, we know students who have been assaulted. Um, and that, that's just across our different campuses. And then um, just on a, on a personal level, so at, on October 12th, um, we had a protest at Hunter's campus. And I went to record, I actually left class to go record the event because I couldn't imagine my great grandmother who fled Nazi Germany while pregnant with my grandmother um, thinking too kindly of me if I sat in uh, my econ class while people were calling for the death of Jews. So I went outside and I recorded um, and a teaching assistant from Hunter College came and stole an Israeli flag that I had held. Um, and he was, he was detained and he is now working back on the campus. Uh, no consequences to him. Um, then just after the, the Columbia protest that I, I met the Felix Project at, I went over to CCNY, which is another CUNY campus, to record their pro-Hamas, pro-terror encampment. And as I'm approaching it, I'm very visibly orthodox. I have my, my yarmulke. Oh, I, I was wearing a white shirt and black pants. Um, visibly orthodox. I walked into the encampment I'm recording to do you know, basic journalism work. I'm a journalist. Um, and since I'm a journalist, I have journalist integrity. So when people asked me what I was recording for, I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm somewhat affiliated with, uh, with Fox and the Daily Wire. Um, and they then surrounded me, uh, directly harassed me. And eventually they had a group of probably 20 students surround me so that I couldn't move. Uh, the students around me were mostly larger men and they were enclosing in on me. And so I, you know, that was very physically intimidating. And then one of them shoved me really hard in the back. Um, and then my, my, my yarmulke fell off and I was too afraid to pick it up because I was afraid I was going to get like curb stomped if I went to do that. And one of the students said, uh, pick up your, your effing, uh, your effing hat. Um, I'll F you up. Until you get to the, the core issue of ideological diversity on college campuses, and there's a dedication to achieving that, uh, it's going to continue to be a, in a lot of ways, a liberal or progressive echo chamber. Yeah. What's the solution? The well, solution is we just got to keep fighting. You got to keep raising these issues. You need to, to work with groups like Campus Reform or First Liberty Count, uh, Liberty Council or First Liberty Institute or uh, any number of uh, organizations that are out there to support students and parents in pushing back and in trying yeah. to create more of a level playing field, uh, both in information and ideology and higher education. And, uh, you, you know, I, I'd say to Jewish students who are fearful about going back to their institutions, you know, you've, you've got to be the, the, the folks at the forefront here to challenge uh, this kind of conduct on your campus, to address it, not to back down from it, to expose it uh, and to work to change it. And um, going elsewhere may be a short term solution, but it's, it's not going to address the problem long term. Ken, look, thanks for joining us. Uh, very okay, important sir, topic. thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate you I, I joining appreciate us right it. now. Uh, Ken Tashi served as general counsel for the Massachusetts Community College System for more than 21 years. 
currently serves as a higher education attorney and consultant, works with Campus Reform, good organization. Make sure you check them out. Ken, thank you so much for being on America's Hope. Thank you.